cried out for blood, satisfied her hunger was. Billows calmed on raging seas, the souls of men she craved. Sun and moon from balcony turned their head in disbelief. Precious love would taste the sting, disfigured and disdain. Friday thief, on Sunday he came. Lay down in grief, but awoke with the keys of hell on that day, firstborn of the slain. The man Jesus Christ lay death in his grave. Three days in the darkness slept The morning sun of righteousness Rose of shame, the throes of death And overturn his rule Now daughters and the sons of men Would pay not their dues to him The debt of blood they owed was rent On the day he rode anew On Friday thief On Sunday he a king down in grief, but awoke with the keys of hell on that day, firstborn of the slain, the man Jesus Christ lay death in his grave. On Friday, thief, on Sunday, king, lay down in grief, but awoke with the keys of hell on that day, firstborn of the slain. The man Jesus Christ lay death in his grave. It's Friday, April 10th, A.D. 33. It's the darkest day in human history. Most people have no clue and are going about their daily activities. Babies are born. Couples are getting married. People are sitting around the dinner table like any other night. Business is carrying on in the marketplace. Children are playing. Merchant ships uh, sail out to sea. This is a good Friday. But on this day, one brutal, horrific death will change history. In Jerusalem, a man who did not deserve to die will face execution of the worst kind. Good Friday? Pilate, the governor, is pressured by the Sanhedrin to execute this man who claims to be God. Pilate's seasoned instincts tell him that something isn't right. A chess game ensues between the Sanhedrin and Pilate, both a pawns under the authority of God, for it is the divine plan for Jesus to be crucified for the sins of the world. This is a good Friday. In John chapter 19, John chapter 19, I want to read verses 1 through 11. It says, Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. 
The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in in a uh, purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they struck him in the face. Once more, Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crowns of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus, but Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said, don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Let's pray. God, we thank you for your son, Jesus Christ, who paid the penalty for our sins. And Lord, as we uh, just have read these words from John 19, it's even hard for us to imagine what Jesus went through for us, a perfect man, one who had no sin in him and yet went through excruciating pain and anguish for us. And I pray, God, that we can just pause here long enough to take that in and to understand it, to embrace it, and to understand, Lord, that it shows the extent of your love for us. God, I pray that this evening... This season would cause us to uh, take a step back and, and remember what it is and that Jesus did for us to set us free, that we can have a, an eternal forever relationship with you through Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Hi, church. I'm Bill Miller, one of the elders at EBC, and it's my privilege tonight to read for you John chapter 19, verses 12 through 16b. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement, and in Aramaic, Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered him over to them to be crucified. This chapter in John is really very interesting because in the beginning of the chapter, Pilate actually had Jesus whipped and his soldiers mocked him and and abused him. Then all of a sudden, after he talked to Jesus for a while, he seemed to change his mind. And that's not unusual in the Bible. Several times after people had come to Jesus, especially the authorities, to arrest him and take him away, they found they couldn't do it. When I got back to the Sanhedrin, they said, no man ever spoke like this man did. And probably that happened with Pilate as well. But instead of becoming pro-Jesus, Pilate tried to become neutral towards Jesus. His attempt at neutrality is shown in a parallel passage in Matthew chapter 27, where Pilate poured water into a bowl and washed his hands in front of the Jews and said, I'm innocent of the blood of this man. Unfortunately, there is no neutrality when it comes to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said in Matthew chapter 12, whoever is not for me is against me. So you see, there aren't three kinds of people in the world. There aren't those who are for him, those who are neutral towards him, and those who are against him. There are only two, those that are for him and those that are against him. 
So tonight, I'd like to ask, what about you? Are you for Jesus or are you against Jesus? What does it mean to be for Jesus? Well, the Bible said that everything that we're celebrating this weekend, Good Friday and Easter Sunday, is all because of Jesus paying the, de- the, the penalty for our sins. And when we accept Jesus Christ as our own personal Savior, that makes us for him. So this Easter season, when we can't all be together physically, let's remember the bond we share as a congregation, a congregation that is for him. And we can all be together spiritually tonight and on Easter Sunday while we wait for the day when we can all be together physically once again. God bless you all. Let me read um, John chapter 19. I'm going to pick it up where Bill left off in 16, the second part of 16. 16b, says, So the soldiers took charge of Jesus. Carrying his own cross, he went out to the place of the skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Here they crucified him and with him two others, one on each side and Jesus in the middle. Pilate had a notice prepared and fastened to the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this sign for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city. And the sign was written in Aramaic, Latin, and Greek. The chief priests of the Jews protested to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but that this man claimed to be king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers crucified Jesus, they took his clothes, dividing them into four shares, one for each of them with an undergarment remaining. This garment was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. Let's not tear it, they said to one another. Let's decide by lot who will get it. This happened, the scripture might both be fulfilled, which said, they divided my garments among them and cast lots for my clothing. So this is what the soldiers did. Near the cross of Jesus stood his mother, his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother there and the disciples whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, dear woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. And from that time on, this disciple took her into his home. Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His trade.
No gifts, no power, no wisdom, but I will boast in Jesus Christ, His death and resurrection. Why should I gain from His reward? I cannot give an answer. Hello, church. I'm Matt Anderson, one of the elders. I miss you all and pray that you are resting in the Lord. Please turn with me to John chapter 19, verses 28 to 30. Later, knowing that all was now completed and so that the scripture would be fulfilled, Jesus said, I am thirsty. A jar of wine vinegar was there, so they soaked a sponge in it, put the sponge on the stalk of a hyssop plant and lifted it to Jesus' lips. When he had received the drink, Jesus said, it is finished. With that, he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Even under extreme agony, as his death drew near, Jesus was about his father's work. In the, in the verses preceding verse 28, we see Jesus from the cross, making sure that his mother would be taken care of. In our verses here, we see Jesus with his final breaths ensuring that scripture would be fulfilled. To the point of death, Jesus was on a mission. In verse 30, Jesus states that it is finished. What was finished? Jesus' mission was finished. In Luke's account of Jesus' death, we read that the curtain of the temple was torn in two. This curtain guarded the most holy place, the so-called Holy of Holies, the place where the Ark of the Covenant and God's Spirit dwelt. Only the high priest could enter beyond the curtain, and he only once a year, after preparing through an elaborate set of rituals to make atonement for the sins of the people. No one else could go beyond the curtain, or they would be consumed. Jesus' mission was to give his life as a sacrifice to pay for the sins of all who would believe in him. With that mission complete, the curtain was torn in two from top to bottom. The path was now clear for the believer to approach God directly. With Jesus' death, we are reconciled to God. God has initiated an open door policy for those who put their faith in Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 10, verses 19 to 22 explain. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain, that is his body. And since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart in full assurance of faith. Church, on this Good Friday, let us praise the Lord Jesus for finishing his mission, paying for our sins, and reconciling us to God. Peace be with you, my brothers and sisters. We're coming off of what Matt just read in verses 28 through 30 and his thoughts. We turn our thoughts to communion. And the question I ask is, why did Jesus have to die? Why did Jesus have to die? You know, that's the most important question of any age and time. The question, most important question is not when the quarantine will end. It's not why is there suffering in the world or, or is world peace possible or, or why, did, why, why is this going on in my life? But why did Jesus have to die? See, we'll never understand God unless we understand why Christ had to die. 
I want to turn our thoughts to Isaiah chapter 53 just for a moment as we share in communion. In a moment, I'm going to invite you to meditate on Isaiah chapter 53 and and verses um, 4 through 6 in particular. And I want to read those verses 4 through 6 and and notice as I read these verses how many times uh, the prophet here Isaiah uses our, we, and us. Our, we, and us. Chapter 53, verse 4. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him, and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. See, what Jesus did, he did for us. What he suffered was for us. You are in the we, and so am I. You and I are in the us for whom Christ died. Our Lord's suffering was not his fault, it was ours. And the more personally we read these words here in Isaiah 53, the more the death of Christ will come to to life for us, it will have meaning to us. And so I'm going to ask you to meditate in the next minute here uh, on Isaiah 53, and especially verses uh, 4 through 6, just have a time of personal reflection before we take the bread and and drink uh, the juice together. Let's share in communion together. The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it. He gave thanks. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance for me. You see, what Christ did, he did for us. Let's take and eat together. And what Christ suffered was for us. Let's take and drink together. Lord, again, we want to thank you for your great sacrifice. For loving us that much that while we were yet sinners, you died for us. You didn't wait for us to clean up our lives. You didn't wait for us to get our act together. You invited us in. Come as you are. Take what I have done for you. Receive it as your own. 
and it's and 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 we have you as our savior lord it's trusting in your finished work and god i just thank you that you have given us this free gift of eternal life and invite us to take it and we never take that for granted but to stay in this moment of great appreciation for what you have done for us on this good friday as we await our celebration of the resurrection. We come and as we uh, meet together, even in separate homes, but meet at one time to remember and celebrate uh, the empty tomb. And we look forward to that celebration together. In Jesus' name, amen. He forgave us all our sins having canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us and that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. And having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and has made us to be a kingdom and priest to serve his God and Father. To him be glory forever and ever. Amen. He became sin. become his righteousness he humbled himself and carried the cross love so amazing love so amazing Jesus Messiah
the rescue for sinners, the ransom from heaven, Jesus Messiah.